This video lecture was made by the Center for Future Dentistry under the SNUSD Knowledge Share Initiative with the support of the Korean Ministry of Trade, Industry, and Energy. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Doctor Strategies Anatomy class. Today, we have time to summarize the total muscles of the head and neck with the aim of preparation for various tests. All the muscles I'm going to cover this time are those I have taught in head and neck anatomy class. Rather, some of them are missing because they were not found in the anatomage virtual table. This video can be recommended to watch with my formal lecture in Korean, of which the link is provided in the YouTube clip details of this lecture, in order to be most effective in preparation for exam. Although it is a Korean lecture, it has a great English subtitles, so I think it will be useful for English users also. This video is the first half of the entire lecture, namely the muscles of head, including facial muscles and masticatory muscles only as a part one of the lecture. Then we will start with the facial muscle. Among head and neck muscles, the muscles of head have two categories, the facial muscles and the masticatory muscles. There are two important differences between the facial and the masticatory muscles. First, the facial muscles have their insertions in soft tissues unlike ordinary skeletal muscles. The skeletal muscles including masticatory muscles, generally have their both original insertion in the bone, whereas the facial muscles have the origin in the bone, of course in the skull, but have their insertions in the skin of the face. That's why when they contract, we can make the facial expressions that we want or intend. The second important difference is to remember especially for the exams, is that all facial muscles are dominated by facial nerves, the seventh branch of cranial nerve. On the other hand, the masticatory muscles are dominated by the mandibular nerve as the motor branch of the fifth cranial nerve as known as the trigeminal nerve. Okay, let's get started with facial muscles. Occipitofrontalis muscle. This muscle is sometimes considered as the two muscle entities, as frontal belly and occipital belly, or frontalis muscle and occipitalis muscles. The frontal valley of this muscle has its origin at skin of the eyebrow and muscles of forehead. On the other hand, occipital belly has its origin at the lateral two-thirds of the superior nuchal line. Both bellies have their insertions at epicranial aponeurosis, as known as gallea aponeurotica. Totally, uh, their action can be considered as raising the eyebrows. Separately, occipitalis muscles usually retracts scalp, and the frontalis muscles usually wrinkles the eyebrow. They are innervated by the facial nerve because they are included in the facial muscles, and occipitalis muscles are supplied by the occipital artery, and frontalis muscles are supplied by the ophthalmic artery. Temporoparietalis muscle this muscle is a distinct muscle of the head. It lies above the auricular superior muscle, one of three auricularis muscles. It lies just inferior to the epicranial aponeurosis of the occipitofrontalis muscle. These muscles may be used in the reconstructive ear surgery. It has the origin at aponeurosis above the auricularis muscles. The insertion of this muscle is at the epicranial aponeurosis. 
Let's move on to the muscles of ear. Auricularis anterior muscle. This muscle is the smallest one of the three auricularis muscles. It is thin and fan shaped and its fibers are paired and indistinct. It arises from the temporal fascia. Some authors says its origin at the lateral edge of the apocranial aponeurosis. It has its insertion at the spine of helix, or the front of the helix of ear. The anterior auricular muscle throws the auricle of the outer ear upwards and forwards. It is very subtle movement in most contemporary people, although some people can wiggle their ears. Auricularis superior muscle. It is the largest among the three auricularis muscles. It originates from the apocranial aponeurosis and inserts into the superior surface of the auricle, more specifically, dorsal cranial surface of the pinna. This muscle draws the auricle upward and is innervated by the temporal branch of the facial nerve. Auricular is posterior muscle. This muscle is a muscle behind the auricle of the outer ear. It arises from the mastoid process and tendon of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. It inserts into the particulars of conquer eminence. It draws the auricle backwards, usually a very slight effect. Next, we are moving on to the muscles of eye. Orbicularis oculi muscle. It has three parts. Overall, this muscle arises from the nasal part of the frontal bone and from the frontal process of maxilla in front of the lacrimal groove and from the anterior surface and borders of the short fibrous band, the medial perifebral ligament, and the lacrimal bone. It inserts at the skin of the orbital region, lateral perifebral raphe, and superior and inferior tarsal plates. As a part, the orbital part has its origin at frontal bone and it inserts in the lateral perifebral raphe. The perifebral part has its origin at medial perifebral ligament and inserts at the lateral perifebral raphe. The finally, lacrimal part has its origin at the posterior crest of the lacrimal bone and inserts at the edges of eyelid. This muscle acts to close the eye and is the only muscle capable of doing so. So, loss of function for any reason results in an inability to close the eye, necessitating eye drops at the minimum to surgical closure of the eye in extreme cases. It is supplied by the ophthalmic and zygomatic orbiter and angular artery and it is innervated by the zygomatic branch of the facial nerve. It has antagonist muscle. The name of it is the levator perifebral superioris muscle. Corrugator superciliae muscle. It arises from the medial end of the superciliary arches and fibers of the orbicularis orcli muscle. and it inserts at the skin above the middle of the supraorbital margin. It has innervation from the zygomatic branch of the facial nerve, and it acts to move the skin of the forehead medially and inferiorly, that is to say, the towards the root of nose. The elevator perpebra superioris muscles this muscle has its origin at the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone 
and has its insertion at the superior tarsal plate and skin of upper eyelid. As I said, the antagonist muscle of this muscle is the orbicularis orculi, and this muscle has the action of retracting and elevating the eyelid. The innervating nerve is the ocular motor nerve because, uh, strictly speaking, it is not the facial muscle and the, it is supplied by the ophthalmic artery. Next, we are moving on to the muscles of nose. Procerus muscle. It is a small pyramidal slip of muscle deep to the superior orbital nerve, artery, and vein. Procerus is a Latin meaning tall or extended. This muscle arises by tendinous fibers from the fascia covering the lower part of the nasal bone and the superior part of the lateral nasal cartilage. It is inserted into skin over the lower part of the forehead between the two eyebrows on either side of the midline, so to speak, the skin of glabella, and the fibers of frontal belly of occipitofrontalis muscles. The procerus muscle is supplied by the temporal and lower zygomatic branch from the facial nerve. A supply from its buccal branch has also been described. The procerus muscle helps to pull that part of the skin between the eyebrows downward, which assists in flaring the nostrils. It can also contribute to an anger expression or frowning. The contraction of this muscle can produce the transverse wrinkles. Nasalis muscle. This muscle is a sphincter like a muscle of the nose and has a transverse part and an ala part. Generally, it compresses the nasal cartilage and can flare the nostril. The nasalis muscle consists of the two parts, transverse and ala part. As I said, the ala part has its origin at the frontal process of maxilla, superior to the lateral incisor. On the other hand, the transverse part has its origin at maxilla, superior lateral to the incisive fossa. The ala part has its insertion at the skin of ala, or the greater ala cartilage, and the transverse part merges with the counterpart at dorsum of the nose. The transverse part is also named as compressor naris muscle. The ala part is also called as a dilated naris muscles. Its medial fibers tend to blend with the depressor septinasi muscles and has been described as a part of that muscles. Like all the other muscles of the facial expression, the nasalis muscle is supplied by the facial nerve. The nasalis muscle is one of the key muscles not formed or inserted correctly with the cleft lip and palate deformity. And due to its being superficial, the nasalis muscle can be used to test the facial nerve. Specifically, it can be used to test the zygomatic branch. Depressor septinasi muscle. This muscle connects the incisive foramen of the maxilla and the orbicularis oris muscles to the major septum of the nose. It arises from the incisive foramen of the maxilla. It may also partially originate from the orbicularis oris muscle. Its fibers ascend to be inserted in the nasal septum and back part of the ala part of the nasalis muscle. It lies between the mucous membrane and the muscular structure of the lip. Depressor septinasi muscle draws the ala of the nose downward and reducing the size of the nostril. 
During rhinoplasty, repositioning of the head of the depressor septinase muscle ensures the normal nose position after surgery. Okay, moving on to the muscles of the mouth. Levator labi superioris alacrin nasi muscle. This muscle is translated from Latin, the lipital of both the upper lip and the wing of the nose. It has the longest name of any muscle in an animal. This muscle is attached to the upper frontal process of maxilla and inserts into the skin of the lateral part of the nostril and upper lip. Historically known as Otto's muscle, it delays the nostril and elevates the upper lip, enabling one to snarl. Elvis Presley is famous for his use of this expression, earning the muscle's nickname, the Elvis muscle. The levator labi superioris alacinasi muscle is sometimes referred to as the angular head of the levator labi superior muscle. It is supplied by the superior labial artery and is innervated by the buccal branch of the facial nerve. Levator labi superioris muscle. It is also called quadratus labi superioris muscle. It originates from the zygomatic process of maxilla and the maxillary process of zygomatic bone. Its insertion blends with the muscles of upper lip. It elevates the upper lip and is supplied by the superior labial artery and is innervated by the vocal branch of the facial nerve. The next is the levator angular oris muscle, which is called also as a caninus muscle. It arises from the canine fossa immediately below the infraorbital foramen. This muscle elevates the angle of mouth medially, gives a smile expression. Its fibers are inserted into the angle of mouth that is also called as a modulus and intermingling with those of the zygomaticus and depressor anguli aris and the orbicularis oris muscle. Specifically, this muscle is innervated by the buccal branch of the facial nerve. Zygomaticus minor muscle. This muscle originates from the zygomatic bone, specifically lateral aspect of the zygomatic bone which is lateral to the rest of the levator labi superioris muscle. It inserts into the outer part of the upper lip and blends with the other muscles of upper lip medial to the zygomaticus major muscle. It is innervated by the facial nerve. The zygomaticus minor muscle draws the upper lip up, back, and out, such as during smiling. The zygomaticus minor muscle is sometimes referred to as the zygomatic head of the levator levi superioris muscle. Zygomaticus major muscle, it originates from the upper margin of the temporal process, the part of the lateral surface of the zygomatic bone. It inserts into tissue at the corner of the mouth, as known as modulus, and it blends with the other muscles of upper lip. This muscle is supplied by the vocal branch and the zygomatic branch of facial nerve. The zygomaticus major muscle may occur in bifid form with two fascicles that are partially or completely separate from each other but adjacent. Usually a single unit, dimples are caused by variation in form. It is thought that the cheek dimples are caused by bifid zygomaticus major muscle. The zygomaticus major muscles raise the corner of the mouth and draws them posteriorly when a person smiles.
depressor angularly oris muscle. It is also called triangularis muscle. This muscle arises from the lateral surface of mandible, more specifically from mental tubercle and oblique line of mandible. Its fibers then converge. It is inserted by a narrow fasciculus into the angular mouth as known as modulus. At its origin, it is continuous with the platysma muscle and its insertion is continuous with the orbicularis oris and risorius muscle. Some of its fibers directly continuous with those of the levator anguli oris and others occasionally found crossing from the muscles of one side to that of the other. The depressal anguli oris muscle receives its blood supply from a branch of the facial artery, probably the inferior labial artery. This muscle is supplied by the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve. The depressal anguli oris muscle depresses the corner of the mouth, which is associated with frowning. Damage to the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve may cause paralysis of the depressor anguli oris muscle. This may contribute to the asymmetrical smile. This may be corrected by resecting, that is to say, cutting and removing the depressor labi inferioris muscle, which has a more significant impact on smiling. Depressor labii inferioris muscle. It is also called as the quadratus labii inferioris muscle. This muscle arises from the oblique line, which is on the lateral surface of the mandible. This is below the mental foramen, and the origin may be around 3 cm wide. It inserts on the skin and some mucosa of the lower lip, blending in with the orbicularis oris muscle around 2 cm wide. At its origin, the depressor labii is continuous with the fibers of the platysma muscle. Some yellow fat is, is intermingled with the fibers. It is supplied by the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve and is supplied by the inferior labial artery. The depressor labia inferioris muscle helps to depress and evolve the lower lip. It is the most important of muscles of lower lip for this function. In addition, it is an antagonist of orbicularis oris muscle. It is needed to expose the mandibular lower teeth during smiling. Orbicularis oris muscle. It is a complex of muscles in the lip that encircles the mouth. It is a sphincter or a circular muscle, but it is actually composed of four independent quadrants that interlace and give only an appearance of circularity. It is also one of the muscles used in playing all brass instruments and some woodwind instruments. This muscle closes the mouth and puckers the lip when it contracts. The orbicularis oris muscle is not a simple sphincter muscle like the orbicularis oculi. It consists of the numerous strata of muscle fibers surrounding the orifice of the mouth but having different direction. It consists partly of fibers derived from the other facial muscles which are inserted into the lips and partly of fibers proper to the lip. Of the former, a considerable number are derived from the buccinator and form the deeper stratum of the orbicularis. Some of the buccinator fibers, namely those near the middle of the muscles, decussate at the angle of mouse, those arising from the maxilla passing to the lower lip and those from the mandible to the upper lip.
the uppermost and lowermost fibers of the waxen anchor pass across the leaves from side to side without decussation. Superficial to this stratum is a second formed on either side by the levator angularis and the depressor angularis, which cross each other at the angle of the mouth. Those from the levator angularis passing to the lower lip and those from the depressor angularis to the upper lip, along which they run to be inserted into the skin near the median line. In addition to these fibers, fibers from the quadratus labi in superioris, the zygomaticus, and quadratus labii inferioris intermingle with the transverse fiber above described and have principally an oblique direction. The proper fibers of the leaves are oblique and pass from the undersurface of the skin to the mucous membrane through the thickness of the lip. Finally, fibers occur by which the muscle is connected with the maxilla and the septum of the nose above and with the mandible below. In the upper lip, they consist of two bands, lateral and medial, on either side of the midline. The lateral band muscle, incisivus labii superioris, arises from the alveolar border of the maxilla opposite the lateral incisor teeth and arching lateral world is continuous with the other muscles at the angle of mouth. The medial band muscle, nasolabialis, connects the upper lip to the back of the septum of the nose. The interval between the two medial bands corresponds with the depression called the philtrum seen on the lip beneath the septum of the nose. The additional fibers for the lower lip constitutes a slip muscle incisive labii inferioris on either side of the midline. This arises from the mandible lateral to the mentalis and intermingles with the other muscles at the angle of the mouth. The orbicularis oris muscle is described generally to have its origin at medial aspect of the maxilline mandible and to have insertion at skin and mucous membrane of the lips. Okay, now move on to the muscles of cheek. Buxonator muscle. It is a thin quadrilateral muscle occupying the interval between the maxilla and mandible at the side of the face. It forms the anterior part of the cheek or lateral wall of the oral cavity. It arises from the outer surface of the alveolar process of maxilla and mandible corresponding to the three pairs of molar teeth and in the mandible. It is attached upon the roxanatal crest posterior to the third molar and behind from the anterior border of the pterygomandibular raphe which separates it from the constrictor pharyngeus superior. The fiber converges toward the angle of the mouth, where the central fibers intersect each other, those from the below being continuous with the upper segment of the orbicularis oris, and those from above with the lower segment of the orbicularis oris. The upper and lower fibers are continued forward into the corresponding lip without decussation. Its motor innervation is from the buccal branch of the facial nerve and sensory innervation is supplied by the buccal branch of the mandibular part of the trigeminal nerve. Its action is to pull back the angle of mouth and to flatten the cheek area which aids in holding the cheek to the teeth during chewing. This action causes the muscle to keep food pushed back on the occlusal surface of the posterior teeth as when a person chews. By keeping the food in correct position when chewing, the vaccinator assists the muscles of mastication. It also aids whistling and smiling and in neonates it is used to suckle. There are three piercing structures in the vaccinator muscle. They are parotid ducts, stenson's ducts, and molar glands of the cheeks and buccal branch of the mandibular nerve. 
Etymologically, in the past, the vaccinator muscle was also written as a vaccinator muscle with a 1C. In classical Latin, the vaccinator is a trumpeter, or more precisely, the person who blows the buccina. The name buccina could refer in Roman antiquity to a crooked horn or trumpet, or shepherd's horn or war trumpet. Before moving on to the muscles of chin, I would like to add the risorius muscle. The risorius arises from the fascia over the parotid gland and inserts into the angle of mouth. It is supplied by the facial nerve, and it may be absent or asymmetrical in some people. Its main action is the retraction of the angle of mouth during smiling. Okay, go on to the muscles of chin. Mentalis muscle. It is a pale central muscle of lower lip situated at the tip of chin. It originates from the incisive fossa of mandible around the mentum of the mandible and inserts into the soft tissue of the chin. It is sometimes referred to as the pouting muscle due to it raising the lower lip and causing the chin wrinkles. It is innervated by the mandibular branch of the facial nerve and is supplied by the inferior labial artery. This is the end of the facial muscle. The muscles of head other than the facial muscles are the masticatory muscles. There are four classical muscles of mastication. During mastication, three muscles of mastication are responsible for adduction of the jaw, and one, as known as lateral pterygoid, helps to abduct the mandible. All four move the jaw laterally. Other muscles usually associated with the hyoid, such as the mylohyoid muscles, are responsible for opening the jaw in addition to the lateral pterygoid. Unlike most of the other facial muscles which are innervated by the facial nerve or cranial nerve the seven, the muscles of mastication are innervated by the trigeminal nerve. More specifically, they are innervated by the mandibular branch of the cranial nerve the fifth. Mandibular nerve is both sensory and motor. The first is temporalis muscle, also known as the temporal muscle. It is a broad fan-shaped convergent muscle on each side of the head that fills the temporal fossa superior to the zygomatic arch, so it covers much of the temporal bone. This muscle arises from the temporal fossa and the deep part of the temporal fascia. This is a very broad area of attachment. This muscle passes medial to the zygomatic arch, and it forms a tendon which inserts onto the coronoid process of the mandible with its insertion extending into the retromolar fossa posterior to the most distal mandibular mala. The temporalis muscle is covered by the temporal fascia, also known as the temporal aponeurosis. This fascia is commonly used in the tympanoplasty or surgical reconstruction of the eardrum. The temporalis muscle is accessible on temples and can seen and felt contracting while the jaw is clenching and unclenching. The muscle receives its blood supply from the deep temporal arteries, which anastomose with the middle temporal artery. As with other muscles of mastication, control of temporal muscle comes from the third branch of the trigeminal nerve. Specifically, the muscle is supplied by the deep temporal nerve. The temporalis muscle is derived from the first pharyngeal arch in development. This muscle is the most powerful muscles of temporomandibular joint. 
the temporalis muscle can be divided into two functional parts, anterior and posterior. The anterior portion runs vertically and its contraction results in elevation of mandible, closing the mouth. The posterior portion has fibers which runs horizontally and contraction of this portion result in retrusion of the mandible. The middle portion, which fibers runs in oblique direction toward inferior and anterior, are used for both elevation and retraction of mandible and in a unilateral contraction provoke the lateral movement of the mandible. Motor units are recruited the most when they have the maximal leverage, maximizing the contractile strength. When lower dentures are affected, they should not extend into the retromolar fossa to prevent trauma of the mucosa due to the contraction of the temporalis muscle. The next is the masseter muscle. Although it is one of the muscles of mastication, it is found only in mammals. It is particularly powerful in herbivores to facilitate the chewing of the plant matter. The masseter is the most obvious muscle of mastication since it is the most superficial and one of the strongest. This muscle is a thick, somewhat quadrilateral muscle consisting of two heads, superficial and deep. The fibers of the two heads are continuous at their insertion. Generally, overall, the acetyl has its origin at the zygomatic arch and the maxillary process of zygomatic bone. And the insertion of this muscle is at lateral surface of ramus and angle of mandible and the coronoid process of the mandible. The superficial head, the larger one, arises by a thick tendinous aponeurosis from the temporal process of the zygomatic bone and from the anterior two-thirds of the inferior border of zygomatic arch. Its fibers pass inferior and posterior to be inserted into the angle of mandible and inferior half of the lateral surface of the ramus of the mandible. On the other hand, the deep head is much smaller and more muscular in texture. It arises from the posterior thirds of the lower border and from the whole of the medial surface of the zygomatic arch. Its fibers pass downward and forward to be inserted into the upper half of the ramus as high as the coronoid process of the mandible. The deep head of the muscle is particularly concealed anteriorly by the superficial portion, and posteriorly it is covered by the parotid gland. Along with other three muscles of mastication, the masseter is innervated by the anterior division of the mandibular nerve. And it is supplied by the mesederic artery from the maxillary artery. The action of the muscle during bilateral contraction of the entire muscle is to elevate the mandible, raising the lower jaw. Elevation of mandible occurs during the closing of the jaws. The masseter parallels the medial pterygoid, but it is stronger and superficial fibers can cause protrusion. Medial pterygoid muscle. It is also called as an internal pterygoid. It is a thick quadrilateral muscle of the face. It is innervated by the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve and is supplied by the pterygoid branch of the maxillary artery. The medial pterygoid muscle consists of two heads. The bulk of the muscle arises as deep head from just above the medial surface of the lateral pterygoid plate. The smaller superficial head originate from the maxillary tuberosity and the pyramidal process of the palatine bone. Its fiber pass downward lateral and posterior and are inserted by a strong tendinous lamina into the lower back part of the medial surface of the ramus and angle of the mandible as high as the mandibular foramen. The insertion joins the masseter muscle to form a common tendinous sling, which allows the medial pterygoid and masseter to be powerful elevator of the jaw. 
The medial pterygoid is supplied by the medial pterygoid nerve, a branch of the mandibular nerve, itself a branch of the trigeminal nerve. This also supplies the tensor tympani muscle and the tensor valley palatini muscles. The medial pterygoid nerve is a main trunk from the mandibular nerve before the division of the trigeminal nerve. This is unlike the lateral pterygoid muscle and all other muscles of mastication which are supplied by the anterior division of the mandibular nerve. The medial pterygoid muscle has function including elevating the mandible, closing the mouth, protruding the mandible, mastication, especially for when maxillary teeth and the mandibular teeth are close together, and excursing the mandible. Contralateral excursion occurs with unilateral contraction. The final muscle of mastication is the lateral pterygoid muscle. It is also called as an external pterygoid and it lies superiorly to the medial pterygoid muscle. This muscle has two heads. The upper or superior head originates on the infratemporal crest of greater wing of sphenoid bone and inserts onto the articular disc and fibrous capsule of the temporomandibular joint. The lower, inferior head originates on the lateral surface of the lateral pterygoid plate and inserts onto the neck of the condyloid process of mandible. The mandibular branch of the fifth cranial nerve, the trigeminal nerve, specifically the lateral pterygoid nerve, innervates the lateral pterygoid muscle. And this muscle is supplied by the pterygoid branch of the maxillary artery. The primary function of the lateral pterygoid muscle is to pull the head of the condyle out of the mandibular fossa along the articular eminence to protrude the mandible. A concerted effort of the lateral pterygoid muscle helps in lowering the mandible and opening the jaw, whereas the unilateral action of the lateral pterygoid produces contralateral excursion as a form of mastication, usually performed in concert with the medial pterygoids. Unlike the other three muscles of mastication, the lateral pterygoid alone can assist in depressing the mandible, opening the jaw. At the beginning of this action, it is assisted by the digastric, mylohyoid, and geniohyoid muscles, which are all the suprahyoid muscles. Okay, this is the end of the part one of the head and neck muscles. In part two, we will discuss the remainder of the head and neck muscles, primarily focusing on the neck muscles. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned, please.